Hi, let's talk about lymphatics. In this video, we'll discuss the lymphatic system and its functions. We'll also touch on immunity and the difference between innate and acquired immunity. We'll discuss the major types of lymphocytes and their functions. We'll discuss lymphatic vessels and major routes of lymphatic circulation. We'll also touch on clinical correlates such as edema and the significance of HIV AIDS in the context of the immune system. So the lymphatic system consists of lymph, lymph vessels, lymphatic organs, and red bone marrow. Lymph can be thought of as blood plasma. The tissue that comprises much of lymphatic vessels and organs is reticular connective tissue. It's a, a dense connective tissue uh, rich with fibroblasts. Uh, there are also a healthy amount of lymphocytes embedded throughout this tissue. In terms of its functions, uh, the lymphatic system's uh, probably greatest function to us all is that of fluid balance. Um, there is exchange of materials at the level of the capillary bed. So there is filtration of materials out into the interstitium. And then there is reabsorption back into the capillary. And this is typically unbalanced, and it's the lymphatic system which absorbs the excess filtrate and returns it back into the cardiovascular system. Lymphatics are also important for the absorption of dietary fats. They can transport uh, various lipids and lipid-soluble vitamins, such as vitamin A, D, E, and K, from the lining of the digestive tract to the liver for proper processing. The lymphatic system is also a major home and host to immune responses. When we talk about immunity, it's important to understand that there are two major types. There is innate immunity and acquired immunity. Innate immunity is with us from birth. It's nonspecific with respect to pathogen. Um, in a word, it's inflammation. There was a, a Roman encyclopedist in the, in the first century named Celsus who wrote on this, and uh, his, his writings have inspired the, the modern-day Celsus triad of inflammation, and that is calor, dolor, rubor, and tumor, to explain inflammation, the four components. In a nutshell, it's heat, pain, redness, and swelling. So in this case, this child has, you know, been attacked by a splinter. And this, this adult here is, is helping to remove the splinter. And the surrounding tissue that's involved is going to attack any pathogens that were delivered through the skin on that splinter immediately. That would be the body's innate response. And you might reflect on a, a minor injury of your own that, you know, after a little while had, had become warm and a little tender to touch, red and, and swollen. There's also acquired immunity, which is specific. It requires exposure to a pathogen in order to then build a tailored response to it. There are many different ways in which acquired immunity can work, but the, the two major ways are cell-mediated immunity and humoral or antibody-mediated immunity. So it involves lymphocytes, T cells, B cells, and their derivatives. So lymphocytes are the modulators of acquired immunity. So humoral immunity 
works via antibodies. B lymphocytes, B cells for short, when they are exposed to an antigen, so down here, this, this nice little cartoon, here is some pathogen that gets absorbed into like a dendritic cell or some other antigen presenting cell. It digests it down. And then it puts a little bit of that antigen on the surface. And then a T helper cell is able to take that and then present it to other lymphocytes. And if it presents it to a B cell, because these cells have all kinds of uh, surface cellular membranes, if it presents it to a, a cell membrane that is just the right shape, then that B cell can then begin manufacturing antibodies that are against that particular shape. And those antibodies or immunoglobulins are now ready to destroy that pathogen. And the cells that secrete them are plasma cells, which are derived B cells. So this is the basis of humoral immunity. And these immunoglobulins can come in, in different forms, different classifications to work in different ways, uh, through agglutination, through the classical pathway or complement. You know, there are, there are many different ways in which they can affect change. The other major way in which acquired immunity works is cell-mediated immunity or cellular immunity. This works through the direct action of cells, specifically T lymphocytes or T cells. And there are a couple of different varieties or flavors of T cells. We've already touched on the helper T cells. Sometimes we call these CD4 cells because this is a plasma membrane protein that can be found on the surface of them. There are also cytotoxic T cells, sometimes called CD8 cells. Cytotoxic T cells can be stimulated by T helper cells presenting the antigen to them, and then they become able to destroy that particular antigen or the pathogen that has the antigen on it. Some survive and will become memory T cells, circulating through the, the body, ready to, to destroy that antigen if it ever encounters it again. There are also T regulatory cells, sometimes called T regs, they used to be called T suppressor cells, that are important for regulating uh, immunity against oneself. Now these T lymphocytes, they can exist in the bloodstream. They can also exist in the lymphatic system. Um, the lymphatic system is probably best conceptualized as part of the, the cardiovascular system. It, it's just a, a separate route of return of blood plasma back into the cardiovascular system. So at the level of the capillary, there are specialized lymphatic capillaries that interleave in cardiovascular capillary beds. And so when interstitial pressure is too high because reabsorption is lagging filtration, that excess filtrate makes its way into these lymphatic capillaries. These lymphatic capillaries coalesce into lymphatic vessels. Um, these lymphatic vessels uh, coalesce into trunks. They, they move through groups of clusters of lymphatic tissue known as lymph nodes. And uh, from these trunks, they move into ducts. So capillaries to vessels and nodes, to trunks, to ducts. And these ducts then are going to drain the lymph into the vicinity of the venous angle. Recall that the venous angle is where the subclavian vein meets the internal jugular vein. There are left and right venous angles, 
and these uh, ducts can go right into the venous angle. They could drain into the IJ. They could drain into the subclavian. They could even drain into the brachiocephalic. Sometimes these trunks will drain independently into various portions of the lymphatic uh, into the the venous angle. But, um, you know, we, we teach this conceptually that trunks coalesce into ducts. These pathways are going to typically follow the vasculature. And it's very common that superficially, just underneath the skin, that lymph vessels are going to follow veins. They'll be very closely tied to veins. Whereas very deep, oftentimes, they follow arteries, as we'll see. Edema is a symptom of physiological dysfunction. It's a fancy way of saying swelling. And if we think about the root cause of swelling, we know a priori that filtration is greater than reabsorption at the level of the capillary. That lymphatics provide balance to this relationship. They absorb the excess filtrate so that overall this is a net zero. But there are many different causes that can throw this out of balance. There can be an increase of filtration, a decrease in reabsorption. There can be uh, issues with the lymphatic system. There are many different etiologies that can lead to edema. And edema can be localized to one particular area, or it could be systemic over the, the course of a body. Edema that's the result of a lymphatic dysfunction is known as lymph edema. One of the other important correlations to the lymphatic system is the HIV AIDS pandemic. This is a health crisis that started um, likely in the 1970s, 1980s, um, the virus, human immunodeficiency virus, is known to be much older than that. But on, on a worldwide scale, it, it really became prevalent around the late 70s, early 1980s. HIV is a retrovirus. Um, it is transmissible through various bodily fluids, uh, blood, semen, etc. And this disproportionately affects T helper cells. If you can recall, T helper cells are key to acquired immunity. If you take out T helper cells, you hobble the body's ability to mount an acquired immune response to a pathogen. When a person has this level of immune deficiency, they cross a threshold and then they suffer from acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, which is the syndrome that is caused by an underlying HIV infection. There are many different ways in which historically and even presently we have chose to define when a person suffers from AIDS. One rather uh, stark objective clinical measure is their level of T helper cells. So when their count falls below 200 T helper cells per milliliter of blood, then we can clinically diagnose a person with AIDS. There are also a host of opportunistic infections, um, things that uh, in individuals with 
uh, functional immune systems don't arise. One of the uh, one of the earlier, um, more uh, visually indicative opportunistic infections that that really led people to believe that something was amiss with the immune system was a uh, a cancer called Kaposche's sarcoma. It looked like a, uh, a, a, a large purple lesion on the skin. What's nice now is that uh, HIV AIDS back in the 80s and 90s, whereas it was, you know, a, a near certain death sentence, now is a, a manageable infection. People with HIV don't always go on to develop AIDS. And many live full, complete lives. There are drug regimens. There are prophylaxes. We understand how the virus works, um, both epidemiologically and biologically. And we have many different uh, weapons in our arsenal to defeat it, which I think is a wonderful thing. The, the silver lining from all of this is that a tremendous amount of research funding in the sciences was freed up to help understand and fight HIV AIDS. And that led to an absolute explosion of research and understanding of our immune system. And that leads us to our assessment question for the video. Antibodies are involved in what type of immune response? Is it A, cell-mediated immunity, B, humoral immunity, or C, innate immunity? Well, antibodies or immunoglobulins are not cell-mediated. Those are T cells. They are, however, humoral, and they are certainly not innate immunity. So the correct answer is B. Thank you very much for your time.